Hi there, my name is Sylvia North. I am a New Zealand registered dietitian and representative from Celiac New Zealand and the Medical Advisory Panel. Celiac New Zealand and the Medical Advisory Panel have brought to you this presentation and for more information about how we support those living with celiac disease in New Zealand, you can find out more about us on our website following either of these links. So in today's presentation, we're going to talk through some special nutrient considerations for those living with celiac disease. So we're going to go into a couple of sort of specialist areas. We're going to talk about anemia and iron deficiency, which is a common nutrient deficiency. We're going to go into bone health, which is something that's really important for those living with celiac disease to be very aware of because of the increased risk. And we're also going to talk about lactose intolerance, uh, which is something that usually sort of develops in the first year uh, when someone is initially diagnosed with celiac disease. So let's get into it. So nutrient deficiencies are very common in the initial few months when someone is first diagnosed with celiac disease. That doesn't mean they just happen in the first couple of months. They've usually developed over several months, maybe even years, while a person has undetected celiac disease. And so if we think back to the physiology of what sort of happens in celiac disease, is due to the damage in the small intestine where those, remember those finger-like villi become quite sort of flattened and flamed and they're not functioning very well um, and they're not really doing their job at digesting and absorbing nutrients very well, what can happen is we develop a number of micronutrient deficiencies. So that means uh, an inadequacy, not having enough of several vitamins and minerals. Now, nutrient deficiencies are common initially, remember that word initially, and that's because as the small intestine heals, it's not the be all and end all as your gut heals on a gluten free diet. Those nutrients usually start to reabsorb, start to return back to normal levels. Now, there are uh, a, cu a couple or a handful of micronutrients that might be really important to just sort of be aware of and include in the diet because if the diet still doesn't have enough, we might still have a greater risk of several vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And so one, one symptom of nutrient deficiencies is a condition called anemia. Now, anemia is uh, characterized as lethargy, breathlessness, and usually a really paleness in the skin. And that's because it's associated with having not enough hemoglobin in our red blood cells. Hemoglobin is what carries oxygen around. So it's associated with not really having enough oxygen going around the body. And oxygen is pretty essential for life. So if, if we don't have enough, enough oxygen, that, that means a lot of our cells aren't quite getting the, the, the energy that we need to, to thrive. So anemia is most commonly associated with iron deficiency but it can also be caused by low vitamin B12 and folate levels. So there's actually a number of things that have to go right in order to make really good blood cell, uh, good red blood cell. And celiac disease is particularly associated with a risk of anemia because we can end up with a reduced absorption of a number of these nutrients, particularly iron. Now let's go into iron, iron deficiency a little bit more, in a little bit more detail. Uh, now, iron deficiency we see very commonly in people with celiac disease because celiac disease might, might be often diagnosed in children and adolescents. And that is a particular time of our lives where iron is needed in particularly high, relatively high amounts. So iron deficiency is more common in children and menstruating females. And that's because of the huge amount of iron required for brain development, growth, and uh, so you can imagine the consequences of not having enough iron can be pretty, pretty, pretty dire. So uh, low iron usually, usually is characterized as poor immune function, fatigue, and if severe, can impact on growth and development. 
Now, the great thing about iron is we have a very good blood test for it, and that is uh, your GP can measure your iron stores for you. The blood marker for iron is called ferritin, and ferritin is, is the store of iron in the blood. If the store becomes too low, so if the bank of iron in the body becomes too low, then we can develop anemia. So if, if iron deficiency is something that, that uh, has been in your history, or if, if you're at risk of iron deficiency, or if you're one of these uh, particular demographic groups, then you want to make sure that you're including some iron-rich foods in your diet. And I've listed some of them there. Uh, the particular, my particular family favorite is liver. Um, it's probably nature's superfood in terms of micronutrients because it is incredibly dense. So if you're not one to eat a lot of meat and you're going for efficiency and effectiveness, including a dose of liver or muscles in your diet once a week or something along those lines is a really good way to ensure that some of those, um, you're getting a really good top up of those micronutrients. So I wanted to go into talking about bone health for a little bit, and that is because uh, in people with celiac disease, we often talk about and hear about a higher risk of low bone mineral density, or osteoporosis is the clinical condition where someone has a combination of a low bone density and uh, possibly one fracture. Now, the reason why people with celiac disease have a higher risk of low, low bone mineral density can be because of several reasons. Firstly, it's associated with that poor micronutrient absorption. And particularly in young people who might be diagnosed in childhood, adolescence, or in their early 20s, they might have a seriously impaired uh, ability to, to accumulate minerals in their bones. And so that's because your bones develop so they get long as you're a child, they get just as, so long uh, through adolescence until, until you stop going, growing taller. But then up until about your mid-twenties, the minerals are starting to, starting to fortify those bones and make them stronger. So if a child or, or an adolescent or a young adult isn't actually accumulating those nutrients, well, because the gut isn't absorbing that calcium, it's not absorbing the magnesium, then, we, then they might not quite reach that peak bone density that we aim for. Another reason why we might see a higher risk of low bone density and fractures is something to do with the inflammation in celiac disease. So if we think about that, that redness, that heat, that pain uh, that happens in the gut in celiac disease, that can upregulate some inflammation across the body, which might increase bone mineral losses. <coughs> So when we talk about bone health, calcium is usually the star, but there are there are many nutrients involved in making strong bones, and I hate to just isolate calcium when calcium is really, um, you know, he, he's just one guy at the party. Calcium is absorbed with vitamin D and vitamin K, and 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 there's also your magnesium, which goes into fortifying the bones. Bones are made out of protein, so simply eating enough protein is also going to play an important role in improving that lean bone mass. So we think of supporting bone health, we want to include a wide range of these micronutrients. Whole dairy, it's not only wonderful because of its calcium, but it's also a fantastic source of protein and vitamin B12, magnesium, uh, animal source fat, so Dairy fat and fat and meats will also carry some vitamin D and vitamin K because they're fat soluble vitamins. Tin sardines are a real star when it comes to bone health because they come with these little bones in them. And you know, when you eat the bones of sardines, you get quite a few micronutrients that also help to support the growth of your own bones. So, tin sardines and, and also tin salmon, they come with those soft, edible bones. They're fantastic. Include your meat and your eggs, again, great sources of B12, protein, minerals, your green leafy vegetables, great sources of magnesium, and the lesser, the, the lesser known uh, sources of vitamin, vitamin K are your fermented foods, so sauerkraut is back in fashion at the moment, 
and yes that's awesome for for getting your vitamin B, vitamin K but when we also think about bone health there are two really important lifestyle factors that play a role in strengthening and developing bones and that's getting out for regular daylight exposure because that's going to help enhance your vitamin D which is the sunshine vitamin and the bottom one here and I've got a lovely picture of a lady doing a squat because squats create build awesome strong leg muscles and leg bones because weight bearing exercise is so powerful for encouraging bones to become more resilient and resistant under stress. Now let's go into lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is probably something that most people are going to experience when they're first diagnosed with celiac disease. Now lactose intolerance uh, simply means a, a inability, inability to digest and absorb lactose, which is a kind of sugar found in milk. It's usually a temporary condition associated with the damage caused by celiac disease. And that's because if we think back to again, our finger like villi, when those become flattened and inflamed, we actually lose some of the, the enzymes which are important for chomping down and breaking down the lactose, the milk sugar. So most people will, will be recommended to limit lactose in their diet for around about the first 12 months after diagnosis essentially for the required time frame for their gut to build back and grow back some of those enzymes so that they can actually digest the lactose again. And then as soon as they're, they're reaching a baseline where their gut is actually feeling better and they're, they're tolerating a lot more foods, then we start to reintroduce lactose in amounts as tolerated. So it really varies person to person. So in my box here, I've got a number of uh, a, a list of foods that are typically quite high in lactose and you can see that it's not all dairy products if you have a lactose intolerance it doesn't mean you have to avoid all dairy but you do however uh, need to limit regular milk which is probably one of the highest lactose foods soft cheeses so if you think about sort of creamy grease creamy cannabis ricotta um, they're very, they're, they're traditionally quite high in lactose because of that milky-like texture. Cream, cream does contain quite quite a bit of lactose, but typically we don't have very large amounts of it. So if you're having a drop of cream in your coffee um, or a drop of cream in your porridge, in your gluten-free porridge, then you're less likely to um, have the same effects as, say, if you were drinking half a cup of cream. Or having a very creamy dessert so amounts matter um, and then the one thing with yogurts there are yogurts that are high in lactose and those that contain hardly any lactose and that actually comes down to the probiotics or the processing and so many commercial yogurts like the sweetened ones um, or the custody type ones they're going to have lactose in them so if they don't have real probiotics then they're not then they're still going to have some lactose, but your more acidic type yogurts, your acidophilus yogurts and your Greek yogurts are often very low lactose because actually what happens is the probiotics uh, eat the, the lactose. So they ferment the lactose into lactic acid, which gives yogurt that acid flavor. Tolerance, so the, the last thing to kind of consider is that tolerance will vary person to person and and it's it's a little bit comes down to experimenting around what your what your threshold is and for some people uh, having a splash of milk in their coffee is not enough lactose to set them off whereas it's those lattes uh, with those larger larger surfing servings of dairy that are going to cause problems so it takes a bit of trial and error and if you if there is cause for concern or if you're not quite clear on what you should be doing with dairy then it's helpful to consult with a dietitian on those sorts of details now fiber is a little bit of a funny one on the gluten-free diet because 
there used to be, or I, I hope there used to be, but it's been debunked now, a myth that gluten-free gluten -free is a low-fiber diet, which couldn't be any further from the truth. The reality is that it comes down to what you substitute it with. So if you have, uh, so just to touch, actually, first of all, fiber is, is that plant roughage. So it's found in vegetables and fruit. It's found in whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts and seeds. It's the husks and the hulls or the, the chewy kind of fibers found in all plants. It supports healthy bowel function and it keeps you feeling full. Now, if you've just started a gluten-free diet and you have swapped your dense, grainy, wholemeal bread for a homemade, for a, a, a white gluten-free bread, because that was the, the best one that had the best te texture, or if you've swapped your bowl of oats for breakfast for like a sort of gluten-free rices or rice bubble alternative, then it's going to be low fiber. Okay, so it depends on what you substitute it with. And sometimes with gluten-free, it takes a bit of trial and error to find the suitable alternatives that fit your taste, that fit your life, that are at your supermarket. And it's, it's just learning some new food choices. So you can seriously get enough fiber while still eating gluten-free. You need to, the, the baseline is focus on your vegetables. Your vegetables and your fruit as your main sources of fiber. They are some of the most nutrient-dense sources of fiber because they also contain lots of vitamins and minerals. You can also choose a number of minimally processed gluten-free whole grains. And so that can be things like rice, uh, corn, so corn in the sweet corn form or in popping corn form, amaranth, buckwheat, millet, and quinoa. Now, all of those buckwheat, millet, quinoa, they can make great porridges. You can... Um, buy puffed flakes to make a yummy dense muesli or granola and they can also you can also buy them in the flour form and you can, you can make bread out of those flours. If you also include lots of nuts and seeds or pulses, beans and legumes, they're great for bulking out meals where you might traditionally have a pasta, you can use a bean like a, a butter bean or a cannellini bean and my last tip is actually Chia seed and flax seed. Now they are fantastic, good little bolsters of fiber. So if you're still struggling to get the fiber up, or if you're adamant on, um, or if the the bowl of puffed rice flakes is just what you're going to do, then you could sprinkle on a bit of chia seed or flax seed, and that can be a great way to bolster up the fiber and make that meal more filling and support your gut. on the fact that those with celiac disease have a greater likelihood of nutrient deficiencies or insufficiencies, you might be thinking, well, should I be taking a supplement? So generally the advice is that supplements aren't really needed and that's because your nutrient levels will improve very quickly once you start a gluten-free diet and you know once the, the gut starts to heal and, and you're absorbing nutrients. And usually that happens quite quickly. Your blood levels of a number of micronutrients can be monitored by your GP. So if you do have a low iron, or B12, or vitamin D, then it's uh, so it's, it's helpful first to have a test to identify whether or not you do have a level of those a low level of those nutrients. Then if there is a cause for concern, and if you do have a low level or deficiency then it's good to have a conversation with your GP or a dietitian can advise you on the best supplements if they're needed. So in summary, uh, low nutrient levels are very common when someone is first diagnosed with celiac disease. But the good news is that nutrient levels will return to normal as the gut lining heals. So it doesn't take a lot of work or a lot of supplementation to build you back up. It's just down for the gluten-free diet. Some people may need to follow a low lactose diet initially, and this is a really good way to troubleshoot if you're having ongoing symptoms. 
uh, low lactose is a very good starting point. But everyone's lactose tolerance levels might vary a little bit, so you can experiment with levels that might work for you. The gluten-free diet can provide you all the essential nutrients in, in inadequate levels, provided that you include a variety of minimally processed whole foods. So that means looking for gluten-free whole grains and legumes and including your vegetables and your nuts and seeds and seeking out for other superfoods uh, such as sardines and liver, um, which can be fantastic sources of micronutrients. And if you are concerned about particular nutrient deficiencies and not sure where to go about with um, you know, ongoing fatigue, talk to your GP or your dietitian who can assess um, what you can do with potential supplements or potential dietary modification. So this presentation was prepared for you by myself. I'm, my name is Sylvia. I'm a New Zealand registered dietitian and representative from the Celiac New Zealand Medical Advisory Panel and my colleague Margaret. Uh, she's also a registered dietitian and representative from Celiac New Zealand Medical Advisory Panel. Thank you for listening to us today and take care.